Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 29th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we outline what we believe HB 4003, what seems to be the House leadership's leading fiscal bill coming into the next session, really does. Second, we discuss former Governor Bill Walker's disappointing recent op-ed on the Alaska economy. And third, we take a way too early look at the impact Christopher Kirka may have on the Alaska governor's race. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into this, Brad. Um, the weekly top three. We're going to talk a little bit about Kirk, as you mentioned earlier. But uh, first, let's uh, well, let's dive into the Ways to Be Mean Committee. I mean, the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this House Bill four thousand and three. This end run around the permanent fund to help fund more government services and make themselves look. I mean, you know, to do it in a heroic fashion because I mean, nobody wants to hurt the children, Brad. Um, but we do love the fact that we're thinking about doubling the size of the uh, doubling the size of the education budget in the next 10 years. Uh, give us a, give us a rundown here on HB 4003. Well, we talked about this bill a couple of weeks ago, but it was mostly in the context of, of house ways and means not following up on the work that the working group had done, that they were, you know, the working group had gone through all the effort and had uh, developed uh, some principles that, that got the agreement of the of the Republicans and got the uh, the the conservative Republicans and the liberal Democrats, uh, and looked like it was a plan to go forward on. And then uh, Ways and Means, uh, which is you know the committee responsible for putting things together, said, "Nope, we're going off in a different direction." So that's what we talked about in a, a couple of weeks ago. I want to take it on a slightly different tack today and talk about what the bill's actually doing. The proposal by Ways and Means is to take the POMB and divide it up. Uh, in three ways. Uh, one is to set aside 25% for the PFD, uh, not constitutional, statutory, uh, and then take the remaining 75% and divide that equally uh, between education, uh, which would get 37.5% of the POMV, and uh, general government, which would get the other 37.5% uh, of the POMV. There's two things about this bill that I think are important and that people need to focus on. One is essentially education is going to be funded through a PFD cut. Uh, the, the statutory PFD as a percent, when you take it as a percent of, uh, of the POMB usually runs around, it typically will run around 65%. When you add the 25% uh, that's, that's set aside by the bill for the PFD plus the 37 and a half percent for education, you get 62.5%. So basically what they're doing is cutting the POMV uh, or cutting the PFD down to 25% uh, and setting aside that difference uh, using it to, to, to fund education. Uh, basically what that means, I mean, focus on this for a second. Basically what that means is they're going to have education funded by middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Uh, the top 20% isn't going to pay hardly anything for education. It's all going to be pushed off on uh, middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. And that's just, you know, that's outrageous in and of itself to, 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 to approach funding education 
uh, in that fashion by pushing the, the bulk of it off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. The second thing about this bill, and this is something that, that we're going to have to watch, the second thing about the bill is it's meant to activate the education lobby, which is fairly powerful in this state, meant to activate the education lobby to get behind uh, pushing for PFD cuts. Um, and and what the what, what the bill is designed to do is to say, hey, education lobby, you're going to get a bunch of money, more than you're getting from the general revenue fund now, uh, and you're going to get it designated. Uh, uh, it's going to be set aside by statute uh, for this purpose uh, if, uh, if you come along with, uh, uh, with the bill. And, and the focus is, the effort is to get the education lobby to, uh, to get the education lobby behind the bill, pushing for the bill saying, hey, this is important for education. This is for the kids. This is, this is how we get the kids funded. This is a stable revenue stream for, uh, for education going forward. We could do all that. We can do all that all out of the general fund. We've always done it out of the general fund. Right. Uh, and, and we could continue to do that out of the general fund. But they're trying to get the education lobby. 4003 is designed to get the education lobby behind the effort to, uh, uh, to cut the P PFD and divert uh, the, the portion of the PFD that's being, being cut uh, to the education lobby. So it, it's, a, it's a wickedly designed, politically designed bill. Uh, to try to you know bring the education lobby on board behind PFD cuts, but but what's most important to me and from a fiscal standpoint and I think should be to Alaskans is is we're going to now fund education. The proposal is to now fund education on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. The top twenty percent escape yet again uh, any responsibility for the costs of government uh, that they in fact are supporting. Right. So I, I, I think it's a it's a bad bill, uh, but it's going to be a bill that, that it looks like House Ways and Means is going to push. And, and we're going to have a lot of discussion about. Well, it. and you can already see that the education lobby is uh, jumping in behind that. Uh, the uh, uh, the piece by Alaska Public Media quotes uh, Tom Claymeyer, who is the president of the state's largest union. He said, oh, yes, this additional money could address different needs across the state, reducing class sizes, improving broadbands, increase the state's ability to attract and retain teachers. And I mean, all this other kind of stuff. I mean, it's like it's, you know, they, they're already they're already lining up behind it to uh, to glad hand it. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And I think uh, I think it's something that. uh, uh we're going to have to uh, oppose. I mean, one of the disappointing things, in all honesty, uh, was in the in the uh, Alaska Public Media article, uh, they uh, approached Ben Carpenter uh, for a quote. Right. Uh, and Ben said he didn't have any opinion on it yet. He needed to study it, needed to uh, to evaluate it. I mean, two things that that if, if I were Ben would have come immediately across my head. One was it's not the working group. What did we spend all this effort on uh, to go through and 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 fashion a plan going forward, uh, and 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 have it just thrown out by ways and means uh, uh, at the first instance? I mean, I, I would have hoped Ben would have defended the the working group. The second is, you're funding education on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. That's exactly what this is when you when you when you make a PFD cut and divert the money that otherwise would go to the PFD. Uh, to uh, to education, you're funding education on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Those are the points that I that that, that hopefully you know after some thought, Ben and others will make uh, on this bill as it starts working through the pro uh, starts working through the process. One of the things that we seem to be missing on this whole thing with draws from the permanent fund is that. Uh, all the projections are saying right now, and it even says it here in the article, that over the next decade, the permanent fund is projected to grow faster than inflation. That that we're going, the permanent fund is going to grow larger and larger because our, you know, we're not drawing too much, and essentially, it's going to be giving more and more government, uh, more and more money to government. And in fact, the uh, the Alaska Public piece says state education funding under this current H, you know, HB four thousand three, would be significantly higher by twenty thirty. Uh, basically from $1 billion, $1.16 billion, to almost $2 billion. So it would nearly double 
in the next in the next uh, 10 12 15 years um and 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 I think that's again one of those gimmies to say hey you want your your funds to be uh, stable and to double and to keep going on I mean we're we're failing right now spending more than when most states in the union on a per capita basis for their students we're still failing and their answer is always more money. Uh, I mean, the other quote before I let you comment on it is from Sponholtz. She says, if you ask any business if unstable revenue will drive performance, they'll tell you no. She said the same is true as public education. Sustainable funding actually helps to drive reform and outcomes. And per- it, it, it drives reform? Are you kidding me? I mean, nothing is changing here. Well, nothing is changing, Michael, except the PFD is being cut. Yeah, I mean we've been fund we we've been funding uh, education uh, out of the general fund. We can continue to fund education out of the general fund. A portion of the POMV uh, is going to uh, the general fund, and it can be it can be you know used for education. It can be used for for other things. There is nothing changing here other than the PFDs being cut, and we're using education as as the proxy for that PFD cut so that education gets behind the effort uh, to make the PFD cut. Education could get more money if it deserves it. It could get more money out of the general fund. It could get, it could have a growing budget out of the general fund. Those decisions can be made uh, in the general fund. All they're doing here is they're using education as the excuse to make the PFD cuts, uh, as the excuse to drive, to drive the PFD down. And and they're and they're offering the, the 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 bribe, if you will, to education of hey, you know, look at this. You may get a little bit more money than you're otherwise going to get out of the general fund if you go along with this and help us in making the PFD cuts uh, uh, we want to do. So it's a uh, it, 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 it's a bad bill. It's a politically it, 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 it's a political trick, if you will, uh, to use education as the excuse to make uh, to make the PFD cuts. And the consequence of it must be very clear. The consequence of it is to push the bulk, is to push the, the the burden of funding for education. Once you do it this way, once you designate those funds for education, is to is to push the burden for the funding of education to middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. The top twenty percent uh, escape yet again, and that's just wrong. If you right. want a state that is fair to its citizens, if you want a state that is equitably financed. Uh, uh, where education in the general fund is equi- equitably financed, you don't use financing mechanisms that 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 that, are, that, are, that push the burden on the back of middle and lower income Alaska families and have the greatest adverse con- uh, consequence, the largest adverse consequence uh, to the overall Alaska economy. All right, let's push on to number two. Uh, Bill Walker uh, and Heidi Dragas have written this opinion piece in the ADN that just says, you know, hey, if we had just put on it, I've got so much to say about this. I don't even know. We could use a whole hour just on this uh, this opinion piece alone. Um, give me a quick tease here before we go to break. So Walker and Dragas are kicking off their campaign and uh, and they did an opinion piece uh, uh, in the Alaska uh, uh, Daily News uh, and elsewhere in the state. Uh, that tells us what's important to the Alaska economy uh, and how they're going to uh, restore the Alaska economy uh, to the benefit of Alaska families. There's one gaping hole in it, uh, uh, which is it doesn't discuss the PFD, which is the very mechanism that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Uh, We're going to talk about that. Weekly top three continues. We finished up with the uh, House Bill 4003. Now we're going to talk about Bill Walker's opinion piece uh, that just uh, popped up in the ADN. And uh, I got to tell you, what a hot mess this piece is. Uh, Brad, your thoughts on uh, Bill Walker's first launch of his campaign here? Well, Walker, Walker's trying to ignore his first term, basically. Um, what... He, this piece is supposed to be about the Alaska economy. This piece is supposed to be how we restore the Alaska economy. The thing that had that has the largest adverse impact, the revenue measure that we use to fund state government that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, are PFD cuts. That's what the ICER, ICER concluded in 2016. They concluded that. They had issued that report and given that report to the administration before Walker made the PFD cuts. So he knowingly used 
the revenue measure when he made the PFD cuts in 2016, he knowingly used the revenue measure that has the largest adverse impact uh, on the overall Alaska economy. That's that's frankly when he when he lost me. When you knowingly do something that's going to have the largest adverse impact uh, on the on the economy. Now he's running again, and now he wants to talk about the economy, and now he wants to lay out you know how his administration, he and Heidi's administration, is going to deal with the economy and restore the Alaska economy. There's not one mention of the thing that has the largest, ad, using the tool that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, which is, uh, which is PFD cuts. It's like it, does, like it never happened, like it doesn't right. exist, uh, and like it's never going to exist. And, you know, we're going to solve the economy by, by flooding in more government money coming out of the, coming out of the, uh, out of the federal government. But, you know, reversing the thing that has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy, yeah, no, I'm not even going to mention that. I'm not no. even going to, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, try to explain why I did it, try to explain why I continued it, uh, try to explain how I'm going to deal with it. I'm right. just going to ignore that and go on. Yeah, pretend like it didn't happen. Remember, this is the governor who, I mean, I, I, I still remember the day I was broadcasting the Iron Dog starting live in Anchorage, and they had all the guest speakers and everything, and they'd had Mayor Berkowitz up and a bunch of other luminaries, and then they announced, and now up next, Governor Bill Walker. And the entire crowd booed. This is right after this. Ha I mean, the entire I'd never seen anything like it. The entire crowd booed Governor Walker. He knows this is this is the 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 blight of his administration. It's why he didn't get reelected. He's going to try and steer off of it. I don't know how he's going to come away from it. This ranked choice voting thing is going to be interesting to watch. But and you read this article, every piece is about how oh I was good at delivering government money. I was good at spending. I was good at taking the federal monies and distributing it. I was good at it. Was all about the government spend. There is not a thing in there about the private economy unless it's attached to the fact that we spent government money to bolster you guys and to make it better for Alaska. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It is. And, and I, and, and he hasn't been in the interviews I've seen thus far uh, in his campaign, interviewers haven't, haven't tried to tie him down on the PFD in the presentation he did to AML, uh, the, 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 you know, the debate or the format that uh, AML held for uh, for governors and governor and former Governor Walker and Les Garris showed up uh, to talk. Uh, there wasn't uh, hardly any discussion about uh, about the PFD. He's trying to sidestep that whole issue, and I and and it's going to be interesting to see when the media, if the media, I suppose, and when the media holds him to account, uh, what uh, what the what the answer to that's going to be. You you you. Intellectually, to be intellectually honest, you can't run a campaign that, that at one point at, at one time tries to say we're going to restore the economy. We're going to you know, make Alaska uh, great again for uh, uh, for middle and lower income Alaska families, for working Alaska families. We're going to make the overall Alaska economy uh, great again. You, it, to be intellectually honest, you can't you can't have a campaign that's saying that and at the same time saying, oh, and we're going to maintain PFD cuts because we know. Governor Walker knew when he made this decision in 2016, we know that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Uh, and, and we know that they are uh, uh, taken at the expense mostly of middle and lower income Alaska families. So it, it, there's this huge disconnect in this campaign he's trying to run right now between I'm the man to restore the Alaska economy and 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 the record of of him as governor the last time he was governor where he where he took actions that had the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and had the largest largest effect on uh, uh, adverse effect on Alaska families i he's going to have someone is going to have to hold him to account uh, uh, and try and and force him to try to reconcile those two positions i'm not i, I don't know how he's going to do it other than as 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 you pointed out, other than to say, oh, government's going to come save the day. We're going to take government money, and government's going to pick which Alaskans get to prosper, and because government's the only one that's going to have the money. Government's going to pick which Alaskans get to prosper, which Alaskan segments move forward, uh, and uh, and and by implication, uh, because we're taking money out of the private sector through PFD cuts, by implication, which Alaskans have to bear the burden of making other Alaskans' lives uh, lives better. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, I'm going to try and get him on the program, Brad, and we'll see if we can put his feet to the fire. I was a supporter of Bill Walker. I was one of his uh, one of his honorary chair. You know, f- you know the whole thing. I mean, I believed in what he and, and right up until the point where the whole thing came unstuck at the end, and then the combination of you know the the unions and every. I mean, it became a mess. And I was a little disappointed. Uh, then I became very disappointed, and now I'm even more disappointed in the talk that he's talking about right now. You would you would think you would think if you wanted to kick off a campaign, given the re- the track record that he had the last the, the four years he was in, you would think you would want to address that. Um, but but he's not. He's just trying to avoid it. It's like it's like I'm from outer space. I, I what four years that I was governor? You know right. Uh, I, re- I remember the good things, but the bad things I did, yeah, I don't remember. Those, I'm so. sorry, I have no recollection of that at this point. Uh, I'm sorry, I failed. I failed to remember that. Uh, so, so, so much I want to say about this the opinion piece, and I, but I still want to get to the Kirka thing. So, uh, let me let me get my little comments out of the way real quick on this, just because I'm so agitated by this whole thing. Uh, first and foremost, the fact that Governor Bill Walker uh, continues to uh, he continues to uh, highlight all these things that supposedly are so great, but everything in this article, everything in this article touts nothing more than government spending. There is not a single piece. It's all about how they've uh, thousands of jobs were created by federal investment, and we're so proud of we of our track record of creating pathways for Alaskans. We successfully awarded more than twenty million in competitive federal contract. It's all about government spending. There is nothing about the private economy. There is nothing here that has anything to do with anything other than going to the government teep, uh, uh, teat and just. Oh, sorry. Oh, can we have some more, Mommy? Can we have some more? And we're really good at giving that money out. That's essentially what this article is saying. It is. I, it, 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 it's, it's all about uh, federal. Uh, uh, it, this is mostly about federal government investment and uh, and getting it spread out, uh, getting it spread out to Alaska. Uh, and that's uh, <laughs> you're exactly right. I mean, Walker's plan is to is to rely on government spending, government handouts, federal government uh, uh, investment uh, or, or infrastructure uh, payments down to the state uh, as a way of restoring the Alaska economy. Um, and, and as I'll say when we get back on the air, he he will do he is saying anything to avoid discussing his own record. Yeah, uh, with the economy and his own actions when he was governor. Right. It's like oh. it's like he it's like he's starting out all over again. Oh, yeah. Was I governor for four years? I, I don't oh, remember Oh, I know. That. I had to laugh because, you know, since the Dunleavy administration took office, he's lost jobs and population every year in our economy. You handed him this turd sandwich and said, please, make it chicken cordon bleu. I mean, he was already struggling, and then COVID hit on top of it. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's uh, – I mean, so the last time, the last campaign was all about the LNG project, right? We're, the way we're going to restore Alaska is investing in the LNG project and building the LNG project. There's not, it, fortunately, I guess, there's not anything in this article, in this op-ed about the LNG project, but now it's all federal investment. We're going to take these federal investment dollars and we're going to restore Alaska uh, with these federal investment dollars and, you know, save the Alaska economy uh, by, by government, by government spending. Um, and, uh, it's, it's not that much different from LNG. It's just a different, uh, he's just using a different sort of revenue source and a different, uh, different spending pattern, uh, I think, but the, 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 con- the, the concept of government spending being the driver to the Alaska economy, uh, is, uh, is the same. Right. No, exactly. I mean, he keeps going on and on about, you know, oh, we need a governor that sees, you know, works with local businesses and local governments and our federal governments to support job creation, economic growth. Get the hell out of the way. If government would get out of the way, the economy, you know, can take care of itself. I mean, businesses can take care of themselves. If you make the you want to make the environment better for business, get government out of the way. Regulations, restrictions, oversight, all the other stuff that's going on. It makes no sense. I mean, but this is this is their constant uh this is their constant uh move here and this is he's showing us this this article does nothing but show his true stripes of how it's all about the government spend federal state everything else and nothing about the private economy yeah exactly right michael and 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 when we go back on the air i'm going to make the point about about the fact he's doing anything to avoid talking about uh to avoid talking about the very thing 
that has the largest adverse impact on the Ala- overall Alaska economy, which is which is PFD cuts. Um, all right, uh, let's uh, let's continue on uh, to number three, which is the announcement yesterday by Chris Kirka that he is jumping into the race. Everybody was thinking, oh my God, maybe it's Joe Miller, which again, uh, you know, I think is. There's problems in every direction here, but you're going to give us our way too early analysis of what you think the Kirka, uh, because I still don't know. I still have no idea what's going to happen here. But your thoughts on this? It is the way too early uh, analysis of this. But but here's here's what I here's what I think. You know, we've seen uh, uh, the the polls of of what happens in a in a three row three-way race, essentially a three-way race between Dunleavy um, and uh, 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 Walker and, uh, and Les Guerra uh, and, and using rank, rank choice voting and how that comes out. And Ivan Moore has, you know, done these, done this poll and done this analysis that says uh, 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 Dunleavy leads until, you know, you, you scoop in uh, Guerra's votes to Walker and then Walker uh, takes the lead and Walker, Walker wins the race. There's a there's there's a segment of of Republicans, conservative, deeply conservative uh, uh, voters out there who appear uh, to you know reject Dunleavy and and don't want to vote for Dunleavy. What I think uh, Kirka does is bring this potential to bring those voters into the voting booth. Voters who otherwise might have sat on their hands, not voted for Dunleavy, didn't want to vote for Walker, didn't want to vote for Guerra, uh, they wouldn't have come into the voting booth. Kirkham brings them into the voting booth. The question is what they do for a second choice. If once in the voting booth, do they just vote for Kirka and then leave the voting booth? Or once in the voting booth, do they vote for Kirka and then put down Dunleavy as a second choice? If it's that, if it's Dunleavy as a second choice, then what Kirk is doing is expanding the base of, of, of Dunleavy votes so that when you go through ranked choice voting and when you get to the end, you have some more Dunleavy votes showing up in that final in, in that right. final race between in ranked choice voting between he and Walker. You have more Dunleavy votes showing up. And Dunlo, Dunleavy, I think, has a, has a stronger chance of prevailing uh, in that final step of ranked choice voting because of the votes that Kirka brings in that otherwise we're going to sit on their hands as long as they list Dunleavy as the second choice. If that's not what happens, if the Kirka votes don't list Dunleavy as the second choice, then what, what Kirka does entering the race is hand the race to Bill Walker. Right. Chris Kirka, Chris Kirka elects Bill Walker because he takes votes away that otherwise might go to might go to Dunleavy and Dun and and in that final step of the rank choice voting, uh, Walker, uh, uh, as as Ivan has said, Walker passes Dunleavy and uh, and wins the race. So it's interesting because I know there's some people in the chat room said I can check the box for Chris Kirka but not for Dunleavy. So I mean I mean is that the question? Do they come in and they just vote for the one? Do you just put Kirk is my first choice and nobody else, or do you bring new voters in and they say I really want Kirka, but if I have to of the remaining three choices, I'll take Dunleavy as a second. That could I mean because again it's almost like the Avis thing, right? We're number two because we try harder. You got to try and run for number two because you got to get through that. You know you got to get into the, it's the second and third round of voting that really makes the difference when the when the whole thing's said and done. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and Chris Kirk is not going to Chris Kirk is not going to win. I mean, the question right. the question is whether Bill Walker or Mike Dunleavy wins. Kirk has a chance of of helping Dunleavy win if he doesn't do that. Uh, he elects Bill Walker. Chris says in the chat room, you can't assume Chris is taking votes from Dunleavy, and I don't think that's what you're saying. You're saying that he's going to bring voters that would not, they were so disgusted with Dunleavy's performance that they probably would just not have showed up at the polls at all. At least he gives them a reason to show up. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's a positive. And yes, you can assume uh, that 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 Kirka is going to take first choice votes uh, from from Dunleavy. I, what Dunleavy needs is second choice votes. I mean, the, what Iman's analysis tells you is that essentially Guerra's voters are going to vote uh, for Walker as their second choice. Walker's voters are going to vote for Guerra for their second choice. And Dunleavy's not going to get second choice votes out of, out of either of those. And in that final step 
of the of the of the of the uh, uh, ranked choice voting in that final step, you need second choice votes. So, you know, what Kirka does is bring the potential of, of additional second choice votes uh, for Dunleavy. They can vote for Kirka for first choice. I mean, those who want to do that, that's fine. But if they don't vote for Dunleavy for second choice, uh, he's going to end up losing to Walker uh, in that final step of, uh, of ranked choice voting. I, my first reaction to Kirka entering the race uh, has been great, great, because he expands the base. He expands the base to people who otherwise might sit on their hands, and he creates the potential that, uh, uh, that Dunleavy gets, uh, gets second choice votes uh, 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 from, uh, from Kirka entering the race. I mean, there's going to be a segment. Dunleavy's still going to get second choice votes from people who believe in Kirka, um, who want to make a statement about uh, about you know conservative principles. Vote for Kirka, and then vote for Dunleavy. Uh, uh, Dunleavy second. He's going to get that segment. The question is whether those additional people that Kirka brings in that otherwise weren't going to vote, likely not vote at all, whether they whether they list uh, Dunleavy as a second choice. And if and if they do, then I think uh, I think Dunleavy. Uh, Dunleavy gets by Walker. If um, if they don't, uh, what Ivan's analysis thus far is telling us is that Walker's going to win in that last step of ranked choice voting. Right. Well, and again, as, as we've said, this is the way too early analysis. This is just some guesswork here, but uh, I think it's some pretty astute guesswork in saying, you know, bringing in those bringing in those candidates that, you know, he had no idea about. Um, somebody just said Dunleavy Kirka unity ticket. Do you think that's a possibility? Because Dunleavy is not announced yet who his vice or his, uh, uh, Lieutenant governor is going to be. And I know that people are unhappy with Kevin Meyer, but what do you, what do you say to that? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if Chris would do that. Um, uh, and, um, and I don't know what the, you know, Dunleavy's got to pull votes from a, a wide spectrum yep. uh, of voters. He's got to pull votes from the Kelly Merricks and the Sarah Rasmussen supporters uh, on the left, if you will, the left of the right. Um, he's got to pull voters from those. He's got to pull voters from uh, from the right. And I don't know uh, what Kirka would do. Adding Kirka to the ticket would do to uh, the Merrick and uh, and uh, Rasmussen voters. It might it might push them uh, to vote for Walker instead. A lot, a lot of factors going on in here, but I, I, I think, I think Kirk has got a is 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 a positive for Dunleavy, as long as, and we got a long way to go before next sure. August when when the first round occurs, uh, and and certainly before the second round occurs, but I think Kirk is a positive for Dunleavy if Dunleavy's able to get those additional voters that wouldn't have come in that come in because of Chris. Right. Get those additional voters to put Dunleavy down second. Yeah, no, and I think, like you said, Chris has got a long way to go. He hasn't announced his running mate. He he has very low name recognition outside of the valley. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to uh, to you know try and combine them right now. The unity ticket is it because uh, I think you're right. The Kevin Meyer brings uh, whether you like Kevin Meyer or not, he brings a certain uh, class of voter to him. I mean, he's attractive to them. They're going to vote for him for that reason. Um, so I mean. I just don't know at this point. Uh, I like, you know, I like the idea of voters who were so dissatisfied with Dunleavy that they just were going to sit this one out. May not, uh, may not do it, and they'd be willing to vote for Chris as number one. And then when they look at the rest of the field, they'll hold their nose and vote for Dunleavy as number two, and maybe that helps. Um, but I, I, and and I think I, you know, there are people who are who are extremely disappointed with Dunleavy who, you know. Uh, uh, have the same view that Joe Miller expressed, have the same view that Chris expressed in his, uh, in his video and want to make a protest vote. Great. Make that protest vote. But, but a huge amount is going to ride in ranked choice voting new day. You got to think, you got to think in sort of chess moves here, three dimensional chess moves here, right? A huge amount of, uh, of, 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 of importance is going to ride on what you do with that second choice vote. Uh, once you've made the initial uh, vote, uh, the first vote for uh, Chris. All right, Brad, what are you watching for next week? Anything uh, you want to give us a quick tease on? We're about uh, 60 seconds out here. So we should be getting the, um, uh, the final fall revenue forecast uh, coming out uh, sometime either next week or the, or the week following. And given what's happened with oil prices, even since the last time we talked last yeah. Tuesday, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the administration treats uh, 
treats the oil price segment of the fall revenue forecast? Do they go with the high prices that they included in the preliminary fall forecast or or do they reflect the 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 much lower prices that we saw last uh, last Friday and uh, now we're seeing it the first part of this week? Uh, that's going to be a big issue and one we're going to talk about. <laughs> and of course, the governor's budget's due out in two weeks, right? So right. we, we got to know what's going on with that as well. All right. Well, right. Brad, uh, enjoy your travels. I don't envy you traveling at this time of year for sure, plus all the other madness that's going on. So enjoy your travels. We look forward to you coming back and, uh, and uh, safe journeys. Michael, thanks for having me. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. All right. Thank you, my friend. Good to talk with you. We will see you next week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.